Continuous improvement comes in lots of different flavors and styles. I'm Bella Engelbach, and I'm inviting you to journey with me to the edges of lean. Episode 93, Continuously Improving Your Voice with John Henney. Do you like your voice? Does your voice help you to get your message across? And how do you take care of your voice? John Henney is a voice coach who works with speakers to help them use their voices to be more compelling and influential. And he is here at the Edges of Lean to give us methods and tips for being better users and caretakers of our amazing voices. John Henry, welcome to the Edges of Lean. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you being here today, and I'm excited about this particular conversation. John, tell us about yourself. What do you do, and what was your path to doing what you do today? Yeah, I work with singers and professional voice users. I've been a vocal coach for over 30 years, and I also train other voice teachers. Uh, my passion is the voice. I'm a voice science geek. I just love learning about all things voice. And my mission is I want to help people use their voice to its fullest and to be able to connect with other people and hold their attention and be compelling with their voice. My path was a little circuitous. Uh, I started off as a drummer um, when I was a child, when I would try and sing. My dad, who was from Glasgow, Scotland, uh, where they didn't tend to hold back their opinions, would go, that's bloody terrible. So I figured, okay, I'm not much of a singer. And I played drums. And in my early 20s, a roommate was uh, started studying with a voice teacher. And he said, hey, this person's teacher works with Stevie Wonder. And I said, good enough for me. And <laughs> I, wow. I, yeah, I started studying. I ended up moving to uh, Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson's teacher, uh, Seth Riggs, who was a very famous, or is a very famous voice teacher. And then I started training other voice teachers. I ended up moving from the drums to the front of the stage and just really developed a love for the instrument. And I realized that, that my struggles with the voice, I could help others who struggle with their voice. You know, I think, that that's an interesting thing because a lot of people say to me, and and I I'm an amateur singer. A lot of people say to me, "Well, I can't sing, right?" They've been told somewhere in their childhood they can't sing, or they've been told they don't have a good ear, or whatever it is. But can you tell us about the voice itself and the sort of the the structure, the anatomy, and is there anybody? Well, we'll start with that first. Then we'll, then we'll get into, is there anybody who really cannot use their voice for singing? So start, start with telling us, what is the voice, John? Yeah, so the voice, very simply, it has three parts to it. It has breath, and then you have these two little pieces of soft tissue that come together, and they buzz like a trumpet player's lips. The vocal cords, or if you want to sound a little smarter, call them the vocal folds. That's the more proper name. And then the key to this whole instrument is actually the vocal tract. And the vocal tract, once the sound waves are created, the vocal tract is what enhances the voice. It's what gives us vowels and language. And so we connect to that through this sensation of resonance and these vibrations and the key to not just singing, but also speaking and having your voice carry and be interesting. It's so essential that you connect with resonance. Now, the other part of the question, uh, can everyone learn to sing? Are there people who just can't sing? I would say that answer is yes, but it is really very few people. If there's real physical damage, if there's neurological issues connecting with the voice, uh, yes, then it would be very, very hard to sing. Some of us are a little tone shy and we have to work harder at matching pitch, but the amount of people who are truly tone deaf is also extremely rare. The voice, you know, it's interesting because they think that some of the great voices that have ever been gifted to us, we've never heard because these instruments are harder to control. 
these wonderful mm. big instruments. And the owners of these instruments, when they try and sing and they face these difficulties, just think, I can't sing, and they never go any further. So it's a shame. And singing is really our birthright. They don't know which came first, whether it was singing or language. And we all used to sing. And then we elevated people to the status of professional singer. And for some reason, we tend to think because they're so good, that precludes us from singing. And that doesn't stop anyone from playing golf or tennis, that they're, they're not Tiger Woods. They can't play at the level of Chrissy Everett. But for singing, that just seems to stop us. And we bring almost this feeling of embarrassment and shame if we can't do it right away. No one starts guitar and feels embarrassed because they can't play an E chord when they go to their first lesson. But for some reason, the voice, we feel this, this judgment and this apprehension. Yeah, and I think it's one, of the, it's one of the first things that people get told about themselves, right? People, so people are told about, you know, well, perhaps you're not musical or, or you can't sing or you can't, you can't be part of this particular uh, singing activity. I want to move on from that, though, to talk about something that you mentioned It was you were introducing yourself. You said that you work with people who are professional voice users, and that's not just singers. It's all kinds of people. So who are the kinds of people that you work with who are professional voice users? Oh, I've worked with executives, um, attorneys, voiceover actors, stage actors salespeople, anyone who uses their voice to make a living, which is a lot of us, mm -hmm. who wants to be able to communicate better, to hold the listener's attention and interest, and also to keep their voice healthy. Uh, one of the worst things is when you have a high pressure sales meeting or presentation, or you have to give a public talk, and your voice starts to fail you, it starts to hurt, you're clearing your throat, and there are some basic vocal health things that you can do to make sure that your instrument is always working well. I remember, well, Bill Clinton um, really losing his voice, right? Going from political event to political event, and then just being left with this husk of a voice. So I think you probably could have benefited from some time with you or someone like you. Yeah, so Bill, as uh, we famously know, at the end of a campaign was completely losing his voice. And that is someone where Bill tends to press his vocal cords together a little too hard. You know, Bill's just kind of in here. And what that does is there's not enough acoustic energy. There's not always enough resonance. And that really is the power of your voice. And so the way that Bill would get more energy in his voice is he would have to really press those vocal cords together. And your vocal cords are opening and closing hundreds of times a second. If you're leading a day-long seminar, your vocal cords are opening and closing upwards of a million times a day. And so as you can imagine, as they're coming together, if you're clapping your hands really hard, after a million claps, your hands are going to be swollen and sore. And that's what happens with the voice. So what we want to learn to do is actually use the resonance. That's where the power is of the voice. It's, it's really not in the vocal cords. It's quite fascinating. So when you talk about resonance and you talk about the vocal tract, you're talking about not just what's happening in the larynx and the throat. You're talking about the head, the mouth, um, other parts of the anatomy. So tell us more about that. Yeah. So your vocal tract is essentially your throat and your mouth. There's a little spillover into the nasal cavity. You don't really hear that unless you're making, saying sung, and you get a nasal sounding vowel, or oh, you're starting to have a nasal voice. Mm -hmm. uh, the nasal cavity is not a very efficient resonator because it's full of those turbinites and all those things. It's very small. But what goes on in the vocal tract is actually quite fascinating. And this is where you start sound. And what sound is, is a change in pressure. Changes in pressure 
and nature's need to have equilibrium starts air vibrating. And it gives us wind, it gives us hurricanes, and it gives us the voice. And so you have these little weather systems, if you will, inside your vocal tract. And if you shape your vocal tract in an optimal way, you're going to have lots of high frequencies in your voice. It's like you've got this wonderful, beautiful stereo. But if you shape your vocal tract in a less than optimal way, you start to remove parts of the sound spectrum. Now you've gone to a very cheap stereo. And that stereo can be either kind of tinny or it can be kind of dull and woofy. One, the lots of high frequencies is a little annoying to listen to. And the other one, when somebody's speaking too low, you can't hear them, especially if there's ambient noise. So you want to just gain an awareness of what this resonance is and find your proper speaking pitch and use your voice properly, and you'll be able to be heard when you need to be. And that's really important, I think, for people who are speaking. One of the things that I have observed many times in speaking at conferences is it's okay if you're up on the main stage, right? And you're mic'd, you're in a big room, ho hopefully you're well mic'd and there's a professional taking care of the sound system. But I think what's really, I have found really difficult is the small breakout session. When you're in a hotel conference room, carpeting on the walls, fa carpeting on the floor, fabric walls, right? A room full of, hopefully a room full of people kind of soaking up sound. And even 40, 45 minutes of that can be very exhausting um, if you're not if you're not mic'd and you have to make yourself heard at the back of the room. And, you know, then there are people uh, like me, actually, who uh, really need to be able to hear well in those types of circumstances uh, in order to understand and if you're not understood then the audience gets tired too because they're trying they're try hopefully trying to follow along so what are the kinds of things that somebody might think of if they're going into that type of situation where there's a it's you know it's a dead room acoustically and you've got you've got to make yourself heard and and not wear yourself out the key to this whole thing is your vocal pitch and keeping higher frequencies in your voice. Not exaggerated, but we often make the mistake of associating authority with speaking lower. And there's something to that, but we tend to overdo it. And when we start speaking at a very low pitch, those frequencies, those sound waves are kind of lumbering and slow. And the high frequencies that we need that, that hit a more sensitive part of our hearing those are dying very quickly, and the ones that are trying to make it are being absorbed by the room. So we need a boost in those higher frequencies. And one of the keys is to just make sure you're at your optimal speaking pitch. And this is something I work with people on. A very quick way to find it is to just go like you're agreeing with someone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and feel where that second pitch is. Hmm, hmm. And play with that. And there should be a spot where you feel your, your mouth and nose really vibrate. Hmm, there it is for me. And then when you find that, hmm, say something enthusiastic. Hmm, yes, that's right. Absolutely. And you want to stay there. And the problem is, as you're talking, your energy starts to flag. Your voice is getting a little tired. You start to talk down here. Well, now to be heard, we no longer have the acoustics doing the job. So you... The body will compensate by squeezing the vocal folds harder. And so they're slamming together more, which is just going to cause the vocal cords to swell, which is going to cause them to go lower. It's like having a thicker string on an instrument. And so it just becomes this, this spiral of the voice into just fatigue. And it can happen quite quickly. And then when and then as you get tired, then you may get hoarse and start doing things like clearing your throat which feels good at the time but actually that causes more more damage right to, to <clears throat> be doing that yeah throat clearing is one of those things that we need to do right if we feel something on the vocal folds and and if we have thick phlegm on the folds it's like putting 
you know, syrup in your car engine or, you know, it's just this, it's not going to work very well. And that's the reason you want to stay well hydrated because you don't want this thick mucus. But when you have it, rather than doing that violent throat clearing, which is unpleasant to listen to, but it's also really slamming your cords together, just go ahead and tuck your chin and just make a, a voiced H like that. You can hear I had a little phlegm on my folds. And then with your tuck your chin and swallow. And that should clear it off. So it's just that, then tuck your chin, swallow. It's not as satisfying as that violent throat clearing, but it will remove the phlegm and protect your voice. Wow, that is an amazing, well, we call that John's life hack. <laughs> I got that from an ear, nose, and throat doctor who works with a lot of uh, professional singers. And it's great because you you will get phlegm on your vocal folds, especially you're w talking a lot, you're working hard. If the voice starts getting fatigued, the, the body will tend to produce more of this phlegm to protect the vocal cords. And yeah, it just, it's annoying and we can feel it. You just take a moment, just do that quickly, and then you can go back to speaking. Watch that throat clearing. It's, it's really jarring on your voice. And I think for a lot of people, it's unconscious. It, you know, it, it's a habit that you get into. Um, you've been doing it your whole life. So this would be a great thing for, for us to practice and to like, like, uh, like all the other things we practice and see if we can change that habit. I love that tip. Thanks so much, John. Yes. You've also, you've also talked about keeping people's interest. So you've talked about finding that optimal vocal pitch and a, and a great way to do that. But in speaking, isn't it also about variety and about um, pace? Tell us some more about that. Yeah, it really ties into when you hear a great vocal performance, when you hear a great singer and you listen deeply, their ability to create variety, to set up expectations and not always deliver on them. They're, they're reaching towards a note and then they pull back just a fraction. They, they change the tone, they change the length, they change volume, all of these things. And that keeps reawakening our interest and reawakening our, our attention. And when you hear someone who's not a great singer, and again, I think everybody should sing. So I, I don't mean this to disparage, but when you when you compare that, you hear the devices these great singers use. Like when you listen to Streisand and the way that she's able to just turn little phrases and delay or move just a little ahead, it you really see the magic of what the voice can do. And all of these devices are available and should be used by speakers. And one of the big ones that people will realize is tempo. That's kind of an obvious one. And when we get on stage, we may get a little excited and we start talking a little too fast. So we say, okay, the next time I'm just going to slow down, but then we start to sound robotic and boring. You wanna use all tempo. As you build up to something, you wanna pick up the pace and then pull back. Make the audience wait for it. You become a singer. I will say that, that speaking is singing. It's, it's a different form of singing. Again, we don't know which came first. And you want to find not just tempo, but also melody, all of the music in your voice. And I will recommend to people when they have to go speak, go somewhere where you feel safe. No one's going to hear you. And I call it the world's worst musical. No judgment. I just want you to sing what it is that you have to say. And you will find it will feel silly at first, but then as you do this song and you get used to this singing, then you go ahead and start speaking and just keep this flow and this melody in your voice and it, it will transform the way you speak. I'm thinking of some of the great speakers that I've heard. Um, and one person I'm thinking of in particular, and I don't know if you've heard him, is Michael Curry, who is the presiding bishop at the Episcopal Church, who is um, African-American uh, and is 
in, I think, you know, a long line, sort of a, a historical line of African-American preachers. And the way that he uses his voice, which I would say is not the most, you know, I don't know that you would necessarily pick his voice out of a crowd, but the way he uses his voice when he is speaking, when he is preaching is exactly like that, where he will stop just when you expect him to keep going, when he will um, suddenly be quiet, when you were expecting sort of the, the big conclusion. And the way that that draws people in is, to me, is just fascinating, that he uses the voice that he has, which is, it's a, it's a nice voice, but it's not the world's most brilliant instrument i think he just uses that to the best of its ability and he does it in a way that really connects with people that people really really want to listen and there's so much rhythm in it uh, the, when he's talking he starts to build up a rhythm and then as you're saying it's almost as if he's he's a jazz singer right now that build up a rhythm and now break the rhythm and that gets that's got, gets people's attention um, so I hadn't really thought of it that way. As it, it is a musical act. It really is a musical act. Um, and that's... Yeah, I was going to say, the magic of great performance, musical performance, is this combination of the familiar and the unfamiliar. If your speech is constantly not giving what the listener expects, you're going to sound erratic. But if you're always meeting expectations, especially if I start to fall into predictable patterns, attention instantly moves away. And so again, yeah, it's this feeling of music. Music gives us the familiar and then it doesn't meet an expectation. It sets you up and does something slightly different at key points. And you hear it in great speakers. If you listen to great speakers, you'll start to hear, as you did, the music in their speech. So, so that'd be an interesting exercise for people that, you know, pick your favorite musical performer. Just, you know, listen, listen for those surprises, for the, for the changes, um, and then listen to a speaker and see if you can find the same thing. Absolutely. They'll use devices like Legato. Because when we're talking, having everything chopped up is a little too abrupt. In singers, everything flows and connects. It's There's this constant mm, phonation going through. Again, melody. And then there's speaking pitch. When we find our optimal pitch, it's not that we want to say everything right there. It's that kind of home base and everything's moving around it. People using accents when you're talking you can just pop certain words so that attention is brought to that word and all of these devices are really really effective you don't want it to be an intellectual exercise i what i have people do is i have them deliberately do this create an awareness of it and then just allow themselves to sing to sing when they speak it's really liberating and your listener, they're going to enjoy what you're saying so much more. That is so interesting, John, because I think for a lot of us, and I just want to talk about, about the female experience for a minute. I'm sure that you work with both men and women. Uh, for a lot of us, we have been told that you about the importance of being structured, of being... Um, you know, practiced, being, uh, you know, memorized, you know, particularly if you're going to be speaking without notes. And yet, as you were saying, a great performance is one where there's that underlying structure, but the there's also there's kind of the reaction to what's happening to the audience and what the, the singer or the performer is feeling internally. And that's what makes the really, truly great performance um so uh yeah that's that's a i love that yeah sing sing your speech right make it yeah and one of the things when we become too practiced and when we become too rigid we often remove 
the very reason for using our voice in the first place. And that is emotional connection. And great singers, like great actors, they have emotional intention when they speak. And they, they use very strong action within their speech, or within their singing. They know that I, at this moment, I'm going to reveal or I am going to rebuke, or I am going to rejoice. I am going to convince. And I would caution anyone from allowing these critiques to start to put you into a box that's going to remove your emotional human core because the voice is the instrument of emotional connection. They've done studies where when they remove the visual component, when they turn out the lights between two speakers and they only hear the voice, their ability to understand what the other person is feeling goes up. The voice is about emotional connection. And at the end of the day, almost all of our decisions are emotional ones. We rationalize them after we make them, so we feel like we made a rational decision, but people are moved by emotions. So don't, don't lose that. I'm thinking now of a, a video I saw on YouTube. So this was uh, the soprano Joyce De Donato, and she was conducting a master class with uh, a young counter tenor, and he was uh, practicing an aria, which is called Where Are You Walk? And so the, what happens, he, he comes out on the stage and he sings this aria, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And Joyce De Donato listens to him and after a while she stops him and she 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 comes up to him really close and she talks to him really closely so you can't you can't hear much of what she's saying to him but what she's saying is well what is this aria about and it's about being so much in love with somebody that uh you you just even nature just reacts to the love that that is is being expressed so she had him go to somebody who was sitting in the audience at this master class, take his, their hand and look into their eyes and sing the aria to them as if they were the loved person. And the difference between what was already absolutely gorgeous and then became phenomenal was all in that emotional content content that was created when the singer was holding somebody's hand and looking in their eyes. It was, it was really quite extraordinary. I had never seen anything like that. And that's, that's a perfect example because you had somebody who had all the technical yes. buttons working, right? But when you remove the emotional core, even though it's nice to listen to, it doesn't move you. And you not only want to be interesting you want to be compelling you want to be emotionally connected with your audience and when you can do that when you can get your voice sounding great when you can use musical devices and then you can emotionally connect in an honest way you you're going to be unstoppable Okay, so let's let's wind back just a little bit. So I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about Joyce DiDonato and this this wonderful young counter tenor and he's singing a love song. Now I am going to go say do a presentation. It's going to be on a very technical topic, John. How am I going to do that uh, with my technical uh, presentation? Sure. So what you want to do is you want to have intentions in everything that you're doing. So rather than thinking, I'm just going to talk about this, what you want to do is think, I'm going to clarify, I'm going to reveal, I'm going to instruct. And when you really get these intentions working within you, it is going to drive and motivate the musical choices that you make with your voice. Great singers don't think, I'm gonna sing louder here, I'm gonna pull back here. What they do is they go by their intention. Much like uh, Oklahoma, right? The, 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 the first song, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. And he's gotta sing that, what three, bright golden haze, I don't know. He's gotta sing it twice. You can have a different intention each time. So the first time, is to just proclaim. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. 
but then the next time is to honor. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. And so when you have these, now obviously you're not going to do that when you're talking about technical, but when you're energized and you're engaged, that's what these intentions are going to give you. It's, it's not all about emotion and love, but it is about connection. It is about being engaged. It is about really wanting to communicate and connect with people. You're going to hold their interest much longer. And certainly, even if someone is presenting on a very, very technical topic, hopefully it's one that they are interested in, that they're excited about, that they, they've they worked on because they believe it's important. There's a, there's a reason for it and a reason for the audience to hear it. So I love that. You know, think, think about your intentions. What is it that you want people to be receiving from you, right? And, and then how might you express that with your voice? Exactly. Very, We've very seen helpful. people who can explain complex things in a really engaging way. And they hold our interest. We feel that they're watching us. They're connected with us. If the audience starts to drift, they catch on to it. And because they're not just in their head, their energy is in the room. So they realize I may need to explain this a little more. And then we've seen the person that just drones and they're just going to get through these slides. And it's rough. Oh, it's rough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, can you talk to us a little bit about the rest of the body? Right. So one of the things that that I've learned in my years of singing is when I'm singing in the choir, you know, I have much space. We don't have much space. And depending on what kind of music we're singing, we don't use the rest of our bodies very much. But when someone is out, as you say, in front and they are you know, singing a solo or giving giving a speech by themselves, um, there are opportunities to use their body as part of that expression. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there is the idea of most communication is nonverbal. And we've all heard that. And there is truth to that, you know, a little raise of the eyebrow, etc. But we don't want to overdo body language. And at the same time, we don't want to feel restricted. I remember working with a great acting teacher uh, who was showing me how to act through song. And I you get up there and you don't know what to do with your hands. And she told me something I, I've always remembered. Just leave them alone. Don't worry about them. When you're talking with your friends, when you're excited about something, your hands move. You're not thinking about, oh, I need to clasp my hands well. I'll set them down by my sides. Allow this emotional intention and this energy to flow through your body. And there are certain things you, you don't want to do. You don't want to stand and sway nervously. And you do want to use your body when you're making a strong point. You don't want to necessarily be backing up on stage because that would read a little more as withdrawal or weakness. You want to step forward into it. And you certainly want to move to different sides of the stage. But one great piece of advice I got because sometimes people don't know what to do with their eyes. And one of the worst, most uncomfortable things is when somebody is, is talking and they're nervous and they just start staring in your eyes as an audience member. And you just have to put on that really awkward smile because you should feel when you're watching someone, it's, it's a bit voyeuristic. You, you shouldn't feel embarrassed to watch them. And you can, just, you can make quick eye content, co contact here and there. But just over the top of their heads, you're just watching a movie. You're watching something that maybe connects you with this topic. And just imagine as you're talking, then you, the movie moves over to the other side of the room. It moves over here. It keeps your eyes engaged. It keeps your focus. Uh, it keeps your energy in the room. Uh, one of the key things, especially when people are having to speak on Zoom right now, is People will not give their energy to the camera. The camera is just kind of this thing over there. And what they need to do is the camera is actually the person they're talking to. Their energy needs to encompass this camera. When you go into a room and you're going to speak, look at every corner of that room and think about filling your energy into 
every corner. We felt performers, when they walk out, you feel their energy. It's like the room is vibrating when mm -hmm. they walk out on stage. Make that room vibrate. Don't, don't withdraw. Be open. Be connected. And you'll be compelling. Wow. Wow, that's right. That's very helpful, particularly that tip about not looking people in, in the eye. I have been told that, you know, find somebody and look at them. But how awful to be the person who's being looked at, right? You can do it a little. Yeah, you can do you can do like a quick, right? You're connecting. But sometimes people will just think, oh, I need to just look. And this person is just staring at you as they're talking. And it's like, oh, this is this is uncomfortable. <laughs> And as a speaker, I've noticed sometimes if you do that, you like you want to look at so, in somebody in the eye, and well, they happen to be right now, you know, looking looking at their phone or or whatever. That's very disheartening as a speaker too. So it's probably better, yeah, not to not to do too much of that anyway. Hey, but John, you should what... always be be connected to the energy in the room, and you can you can feel that as you're speaking, you can feel when attention is maybe starting to slip, and you realize, oh. I need to pick this up a little bit. I maybe need to do some pattern change, maybe just get a little louder, do something to re-engage their attention. Yeah, so it's a signal. It's not, a, uh, it's, it's not the end of the world. No, no. And you always have to remember that not everybody's gonna find you interesting. I, I always, before I go out, just mentally give everyone permission to not like me because they have that right anyway. And so then I'm, I'm not worried about that. I'm there for the people who do need to hear what I have to say. And if you feel that you don't, that's fine. That's your right. I, I can't be worried about it. What a great way to look at it. John, we've talked about the vocal folds. We've talked about, about the vocal tract and resonance. And you mentioned breath at the beginning. Could you just give us breathing 101? Sure. So breathing is actually a hotly debated topic in the vocal world. And some voice teachers really make it everything and you really, really work on breathing. And other teachers don't put as much emphasis on it. Some will talk about the, the tummy should remain out as you sing, others pull the tummy in. The bottom line is different methods of breathing work. What you don't want to do is kind of lazy, shallow breaths or what they'll call, you know, breathing for at the lifting the chest up and down, right? You, you want to have your chest nice and open. You can feel your ribs expanded. You hold what is often called a noble po a posture, right? You're just standing nice and tall, but not a sway back. You, and then when you breathe in, just allow your tummy to expand. And some people have a problem with this, right? Because they're always trying to suck their tummy in. But when the diaphragm descends, there are two things that happen when we breathe in. We have muscles that elevate the ribs, that separate and elevate them. And then the diaphragm descends. And what, what that does is, is it enlarges your thorax, your chest cavity, which then the ribs are attached. I'm sorry, the lungs are attached. And so then the lungs expand, which creates a vacuum that brings air in. And then as you breathe air out, I just tell people, just feel this little press from the tummy. And you can practice that. You can make that press feel, some people will hold like they're pressing out with the tummy. Some people will pull the tummy in, but it's just controlled. What we want is we want the breath to have a steady flow. And we want it to have a steady speed. And then we can change that depending on volume, et cetera. But if we kind of press too hard from everything, we're going to get too much breath. And sometimes people think, okay, I'm gonna worry about breathing. And then they just take a huge intake of breath. And what that does is now the lungs are really pushed to the limit and you're going to have elastic recoil. And so you're taking this big breath and then you go to speak and air is just going to rush out. When you take in a breath, it's just like you, you're greeting a friend you haven't seen in a while. Just kind of that nice surprise. Oh, nice to see you. That's plenty of air. And then just, you can practice it just on a hiss. And you just get this nice flow of air. And that's going to give enough fuel to the vocal folds 
to start that system of the sound wave and resonance and and that goes out into the room to the listener's ears. And if you are a compelling enough speaker, no one's going to be looking at your midsection anyway, so you don't need to worry about That what, is very what, true. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Yeah, I, one of the things that that I've learned recently in my singing practice is that for me it's about actually feeling that in my pelvis. And I never, but, and my teacher has told me, you know, different people feel it in different places. And for me, it's just feeling it in the pelvis. And that, that works beautifully for me, but you know, it took me, took me years to find that, that right spot. So and I know it's different for everyone. John, how can people find you if they'd like to learn more from you? Yeah, my main website is johnhenny.com. And for speakers, you can go to compellingspeaker.com. Compellingspeaker.com. Terrific. And John, tell me, what is your one piece of advice for a young person starting out? I would connect with your voice, have an awareness of your voice, and take care of your voice. You have two little pieces of soft tissue the size of your thumbnail that need to take you through your whole life. And taking care of your voice is going to help not only your professional life, but also your personal life. It is our number one means of emotional connection with other people. And as we go further into this brave new world of technology and AI, Human yeah. connection is going to become more and more important. So start appreciating this instrument. Don't take it for granted and really start to connect with the sensations and how it works. Beautiful advice. Thank you so much. John, thank you for traveling with me to the edges of lean. Thank you so much. This is Bella Engelbach, and I'd like to thank John Henney for being my guest on The Edges of Lean. What did you learn from this conversation? What ideas did it spark for you? We would love to hear from you. Find John at compellingspeaker.com, where you could get a free speaker warm-ups checklist to keep your voice healthy, and you can connect with John on LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn or at leanforhumans.com or comment wherever you watch or listen. Subscribe and tell a friend about The Edges of Lean. Please join me in exploring more of The Edges of Lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends in the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelbach with support from Podcast Inc. This is a Lean for Humans production.